Well, good evening, everyone. I feel that it's better I stand up because I want to be able to look at the faces. Uh, it inspires me and also warns me, for example, <laughs> if people are falling asleep or, you know, <laughs> making faces, then I know that I am going in the wrong direction. So I always have to to have the opportunity to uh, look at the faces and being inspired. And I have to look at these faces. So allow me to move a little bit and go like this. In uh, reflecting about the topic today, about love, its origins, and its impacts in our lives and in our roles, certain thoughts came to my mind. Because love is very, very confusing. Uh, issue. I have been uh, reflecting on this and writing for about 50 years and still struggling with the concept. The reason is that love is a condition that everybody is seeking. We all are seeking love. We all want to be loved. We all want to love. This is universal. Everywhere you go, this is the situation. And then everywhere that you go, you will see that people lamenting that their love life, their love relationships, their state of love, is unsatisfactory. You seldom find people who say that they really are in a very satisfactory and complete and unconflicted love relationship. And these two combination makes us to makes it necessary for us to think about the phenomena of love more deeply and to see what it is all about and why this is the situation <coughs> with love. And of course, the third problem arises when you ask people what they mean by love. For example, in this room, if we were going to ask, what is your definition of love? And you were going to write it, it would be very interesting to see what you write. And you will see that we will come up with many, many different definitions of love. And also different kinds of love that we experience in life. So, there are, broadly speaking, two schools of thought about love. One school of thought considers love to be basically a biological condition with psychological and social expressions and physical expressions. In other words, he sees love as being the result of chemical changes in human body in general and human brain in particular, which gives us certain sensations and feelings and and, uh, you know, in the general media, they always talk about it, you know, uh, the, the way that people smell or the way this or that or the look. And the whole phenomenon of love is viewed as being basically the outcome of uh, 
physical condition of human beings. And then it, it expresses itself in psychological feelings and uh, uh, social relationships. So they see everything, love, feelings, and relationships to be all materialistic in nature. Okay, that's one group of uh, ideas. And they're all very, very powerful, very common, because in our times we live basically a materialistic life. And uh, we have materialistic orientations, and these ideas have become increasingly common. In, in the world. And because of that, the great emphasis, the greatest emphasis on love is with respect to pleasure, to enjoyment, to gratification, sexual gratification, food gratification, clothes, shoes, cars, doesn't matter what. They are all expressions, as far as people are concerned, expressions of love. And if you are a millionaire or billionaire, then uh, you know, diamonds and all kind of things. For example, this di- this ring that has been made totally of diamonds, you have seen it on television, is uh, $64 million. And, you know, somebody is going to buy it and give it as an expression of love to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you will love them and say, oh, I love you so much, of course, <laughs> you know. Why not? You know, $64 million? That's, you know, it's worth it. So, <laughs> so that's one way that love has evolved and, and as a result, love has lost its sacred dimension. Because in older times, love was a sacred phenomenon. And now it has become a secular phenomenon. Okay. Now, the other school of thought continues to consider love as a sacred divine phenomenon that has biological, psychological, and social relational expressions. In other words, it considers the source of love to be something divine, something spiritual. And this something spiritual and divine in human uh, reality then affects the body to, to have certain experiences and our psychological conditions be affected in certain ways and uh, our relationships be affected likewise. So these are the two ways of looking at the phenomena of love. Now, in the Baha'i faith, when we go and look at the Baha'i faith, we find a very interesting approach to the issue of love. But before we do that, before we talk about the Baha'i faith, let's see what other people have said about love. And I read you a few statements of different people about love. It just give, give us a feeling of what, what, what people think. For example, Shakespeare asks, whoever loved that loved not at first sight, Okay, and he concludes, to be wise and love exceeds man's might. To be wise and love exceeds man's human being's might. In other words, it's impossible to be wise and to be in love. Which, of course, as we know, in love relationships between people, people fall in love, right? We all fall in love. And love is blind. Okay? 
and we don't have a control over it, you see. In the, so in the passionate interpersonal love relationship, love is mightier than wisdom. And, and human beings therefore lose their rationality to, to the forces of love. Okay. Einstein, invoking the laws of physics, assure us, assures us that gravitation cannot be held responsible for people falling in love. <laughs> this is the exact quote from him, okay? He says, gravitation cannot be held responsible for people falling in love. Okay? Now that's very interesting because from a philosophical perspective, gravitation is the physical counterpart of love in human beings. What does, what does love do, do in human beings? It brings people to, close to each other, attracts people to each other, connects people to each other, right? In marriages, in families, parents, children, communities of people, and so forth. It, the people gravitate toward each other through the force of love. And therefore, and in the nature, there is a force, force of gravity, that brings things people, people, things together and keeps them together, right? All, everything that exists is connected to each other through the force of gravitation, okay? The galaxies and the atom and subatomic particles, all of them are connected to each other, okay? And therefore gravitation is the counterpart of phenomena of, of love in human relationships. And here, that's why Einstein says gravitation cannot be held responsible for people falling in love. So, that's, because falling in love has all kind of problems with it. Gravitation doesn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Einstein wanted to say, you know, it's not my fault. Okay. <laughs> it's not my fault. Okay. Mozart, Speaking of genius, because Mozart was a genius himself, so he spoke of genius. He observed that neither a lofty degree of intelligence, nor imagination, nor both together go to the making of genius. Love, love, love. That is the soul of genius. Isn't that beautiful? He says, neither a lofty degree of intelligence, nor imagination, nor both together go to the making of love. A genius. Love, 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 that is the soul of genius. So all of you who are wanting to be genius, love, 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 okay? Remember that. Freud, in Freud, he warns us <laughs> about love. He warns us, he says, one is very crazy when in love. One is very crazy when in love. And he says that it is always possible to bind together a considerable number of people in love so long as there are other people left over to receive the manifestations of their aggression. Now, this is very interesting. Because Freud believes that it is impossible to love without aggression, without anger, without some degree of violence. He feels that love and aggression are together, always are together. 
So he says here, he says, yes, it is possible to have a group of people who love each other as long as there is another group that they can hate. <laughs> okay, so we we connect together against another group. And this is, of course, the phenomenon we, we see in the world today. And when you look at the world today, you will see that the world is divided in groups who say we love each other and hate the others. And they are at war with each other, others and religions, nationalities, races, men and women, you know, you name it. It is, it is that phenomenon. So, so is that the foundations of solidarity? So is that like the, I guess, the, the concept of solidarity? Solidarity, group solidarity, solidarity, yes. This, from a, from Freudian perspective, the notion of solidarity is that you have to have always an enemy. Okay. You have to have somebody that you can have your aggression you know, against them, because he believes that human beings by nature are aggressive. Okay, that's, that's, Freud, of course, has proven to be wrong, but nevertheless, uh, his, the phenomena that he describes is something that we observe in the world, and we have to try to understand why, why is that way, okay? Then Martin Luther King stresses that mankind must evolve for all human conflicts, uh, evolve for all human conflict a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. So Martin Luther King comes exactly to deal with the phenomena that Freud has talked about, aggression, and says the only way that you can find a method that fights with aggression, with violence in the world, is a method based on love. But he doesn't go about to describe how to do it, what the method is, and so forth, but at least he describes it at that level. And Confucius, now that we have gone around the world, it's a good idea to see what Confucius says. Confucius is very practical, like all Chinese are, right? He says, uh, he says, choose a job you love, and you will never have to work a day in your life. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. All right. Choose a job you love, and you never have to work a day in your life. Okay. So, so these are the, some of the reflections and the statements that have been made about love in everyday activities, everyday life. And I think in this respect is a good idea to read, uh, for me to read a statement by Abdul Baha. Uh, which also deals with everyday life, okay, so that we see how, in the Baha'i perspective, we deal with this issue. Abdul Baha at that time uh, was uh, in Paris, October uh, 1912. He was in Paris. And he was uh, uh, giving a talk, and in that group there was a person who stood up and said, my aim in life is to transmit as far as is in my power the message of Krishna to the world. This person stood up and said that. Okay? And here was Abdul Baha answered to this gentleman's statement. He said, the message of Krishna is the message of love. Now, isn't that interesting? You, you see, here is very interesting phenomena. Abdul Baha'i is talking, of course, everybody knows that he is a Baha'i, okay? And another person gets up and in essence says, I'm not going to listen to you, Abdul Baha. I'm going to go and promote the teachings of Krishna. 
Okay, so it's a a kind of an antagonistic comment to be to be made in that gathering. Okay, so what Abdul Baha does immediately turns it around and puts it in the context of love. Okay, he says the message of Krishna is the message of love, and then he says all God's prophets have brought the message of love then he includes everybody. So you see how here the the circle of love suddenly becomes universal. Not a small circle, Krishna or Baha'i or Christian. All prophets. And then he said, none has ever brought, none has ever taught that war and hate are good. Everyone agrees in saying that love and kindness are best. And then Abdul Baha goes on, love must manifest in its reality in deeds, not only in words. These alone are not without effect. Words alone do not have an effect. In order that love may manifest its power, there must be an object, an instrument, a motive. Now, this is a fundamental issue. The nature of love is determined by the object of your love. Okay? That's the reason that love is expressed differently when you have different objects. Okay? For example, the love of a man and a woman who are married, okay, is expressed differently than the love of a parent and a child. And differently, the love of the friends. And differently, the love of a teacher and a student. Right? All of them are expressions of love, but because the object of love is different, then the expression of love, the type of love that is expressed, is different. Now, the object of love can be sublime and could or could be ridiculous. In other words, somebody can say, I love chewing gum. Okay? Or somebody can say, I love humanity. Somebody can say, I love war. Okay? Or I love only my people. Or I love only this or that. So, the nature of love, the quality of love is dependent on the object of love. What is it that you are loving? And when you decide on that, then the nature of love and the scope of love and the depth of love is going to express itself. Okay. The second issue that Abdul Baha brings up here, he says that not only the object of love affects the nature of love, But the motive that you have, why you are loving somebody. For example, if a person says, thinks that I better love this person because he is rich, or better love this person because he is powerful, or better love this person for whatever reason, I am going to get a benefit from it. Okay, then love becomes a commodity. It's, it's not a phenomenon that that uh, you know uh, is independent from the motive that you have. Some many people express love without pure motive. You know, many relationships break up because at the beginning of the relationship, the 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 two that are in love, they they 
say all, all kind of expressions of love in order to connect the other person with themselves with the motivation of getting what they want to get. And when they that when they got what they want to, then the love comes to an end. That's the reason that we see so many temporary love relationships in the world. Because the motive usually is self-centered. What am I going to get out of it? It's not, I love this person because of the qualities of that person. But I love that person because that person makes me happy or makes me this or makes me that or gives me this or gives me that. So, so the motive that you have, not the ob- not only the object of love that you choose, the motivation that is behind the expression of love also is going to determine the nature of love. And of course, is the instruments that we use to express love. How do we express our love? Many, many people express their love through material gifts, giving things, you know, giving. That's one kind of expression of love. But how many times we have heard people saying, but this person only doesn't spend time with me, that is not interested in what I do, is not interested in my thoughts and this and that, is only interested, um, you know, in the uh, only way that he or she expresses love is by giving me gifts, okay, or giving me things and so forth. So the instrument that you use, the object of love that you have, and the motivation that is there, all of them affect the type of love that is in human relationships. So the more we talk about it, the more it becomes clear that love is a very complex phenomenon. Now let's reflect for a moment our on our own experience of love. And as you do that, you will notice that the whole notion of love comes naturally to us. In other words, nobody needs to tell us that we want to love and we want to be loved that we need love. We know it. We know it. Intrinsically, we know it. Within our very being, we know it. And the reason for this is because love is connected to the human consciousness. You see, You cannot be in love and not to be conscious of being in love. You see, love requires consciousness. It requires awareness. You have to know that you love. Okay? You you can you can say, well, I didn't know that I was in love. You know, if you didn't know then you were not, you see. So love is always a conscious phenomenon. And consciousness is the quality of human soul. And it is here that in the the notion of love having a divine origin comes. The idea is that we human beings, by virtue of the fact that we are conscious beings, and by virtue of the fact that consciousness is the characteristic of human psyche or human soul, because of that, love by itself is a spiritual characteristic of being human. Okay? 
actually there are three things that are inviolable characteristics of being human because they are powers of human consciousness. One is to love, the other one is to know, and the third one is to choose. We do that in everyday life. Everything that we do is based on a certain level of understanding, certain level of attraction and desire and love to do something, motivation, and and a choice that we make. Everything that we do are expressions of the functions of the human soul. So, as we reflect on these, then we uh, can now begin to uh, address of what is the origin of love. And in order to understand that, we should go back to the uh, spiritual teachers of humanity, which are the founders of religions, and to see what they say. And I would share with you some statements from Baha'i writings, because here we are talking about the Baha'i concept of origins of love and uh, its uh, role in human life. So, one of the most interesting statements uh, in the uh, in the Baha'i writings is uh, a statement by Baha'u'llah in which he says, I knew, this is talking from God, God is speaking to humanity. I knew of my love for thee, therefore I created thee. Okay. Now, this is very interesting statement. I knew knowledge, my love for thee, love, therefore I created thee. The choice of creation and action, right? The three powers of human soul. Knowledge, love, and creation. So, our existence is because of expression of love of God for us. That's the origins of love. The origin of love is that God knew of his love for us and he created And in doing so, therefore, he establishes a relationship. Now we have a relationship with God. And we have to see how we are going to reciprocate this relationship. And in the writings of the Baha'i faith, we come constantly across statements like this. That it talks about the relationship of human beings with God. For example, Baha'u'llah says, love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, in no wise my love can reach thee. Okay? Now that's very interesting. Because here we are talking about the developmental stages of love. You see, love is expressed differently at different stages of development. For example, a child expresses love in what way? The child expresses love by receiving our love. We take care of the child, we feed the child, we stay awake for the child, we do all of the things that we do, and when the child responds, accepts our care, and gives us a hug, right? Then we feel that the love is, the child is loving us back. The love of child is a one directional love. We give love, and the child receives. 
we give love and child receives. And in the history of religion, it has been also the same way that as humanity has been growing up and it has been in earlier stages of its childhood, the way that religions have been described has been God's, you know, in read in different holy books. He said that God says, I give you this and this and that and that, and all you have to do is to obey, is to receive. Okay? And if you receive, you're in good shape. Okay? It's like a parent and a child relationship. Now, humanity is living at the time of his collective adolescence. And adolescent love is a chaotic love. It's, it's passionate and is changing, constantly changes. So adolescents, when they love, one day they love each other, the other day they hate each other. Right? They love and hate. And the object of love constantly changes. They, they are in love with this, they are in love with that, they are in love with that, they are in love with everything, they are in love with nothing. This is the nature of chaos of adolescence. And humanity now collectively is in age of adolescence. And that's why there is so much chaos in the world today. So much chaos. Okay. Because in the world today, the adolescent humanity doesn't know how to choose an a appropriate object of love. So the objects of love are very scattered, you know, it's confusing right now. And the motivation for love is not, the motive that is there is is not clear. And the instruments chosen for showing love are all confusing. So this is the, this is one of the reasons that in our world, in this time in history, we have such problems with expression of love in all areas of our life. Because we are in that age of transition. But when we mature and we grow and we go to a higher level of relationship, then love becomes give and take. We love and be and because we love, we will be loved back. Okay? It is, it, it becomes a mutual process of giving love and being able to receive love. You know, there are many people who give, 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 but they cannot receive. Have you had experience with those people? They create enormous guilt in you. And anger. They create guilt and anger. They, they make you feel guilty because after, suddenly they say, I did so much for my children or something, and look what they are doing now. Okay? Nobody appreciates. You hear that, which creates guilt. Or you try to do something and the person doesn't accept it, and you feel angry. That the person doesn't accept your giving of love. These are expressions of earlier stages of love. A mature stage of love is the capacity to give love and to receive love. And both of these required a mature personhood. We have to become evolve as individuals and become more whole as individuals. People who have doubt about their identity of who they are, they have tremendous difficulty to accept love or to give love, especially accept love. And also, people who have doubts about their identity, their love invariably is mixed with aggression. So love and aggression go together in stages when love, the person, uh, 
has doubts about his own or her own nobility, lovability, and uh, so forth, you see. Because many people don't feel lovable. They feel doubtful about their own lovability. They, they are not sure whether, whether they are worthy of being loved. You see? So this process of evolving and, and maturing is so fundamental for development of a mature love, which of course means that we have to develop self-knowledge. And self-knowledge is a very difficult thing because self-knowledge is a painful process. Maybe as we look at ourselves, we constantly discover all kinds of things that we wish we didn't know. Okay? <laughs> Usually we don't say, I wish I didn't have those things. We say, I wish I didn't know, I wish I didn't think about it. So what we do, we go and drink, we take drugs, we busy ourselves with all kind of activities to forget not to go the path of self-knowledge. Because self-knowledge is a painful journey, but is an essential journey for love. Okay? Because the, in, in our life process, we search for the object of love, then we fall in love. And when we fall in love, we have to get to know the object of our love. Okay? Because if we don't know the object of our love, we wouldn't be able to create the next stage of development. You know, there is a book in the by Baha'u'llah in which is called Seven Valleys. And in the seven valleys, he is describing the journey of human soul, human beings, from material biological beings on the process of ascendance to ever higher levels of spirituality, sacredness. Okay. So the first valley is the valley of search. We are constantly searching, looking, looking, looking. Then the next valley is the valley of love. We fall in love. We find something. We find somebody. We find, find, we find God. And we fall in love. And when you fall in love, you, you have to do something very fundamental. When you fall in love, you have to sacrifice. You have to sacrifice your ego. You have to sacrifice your self selfishness. You have to sacrifice your self-centeredness. You have to sacrifice your self-comfort. It's not easy to love another human being. So you have to sacrifice. And when you sacrifice, you experience pain. And that's why Baha'u'llah says the seed of value of love is pain. Love and pain are together. But this is the pain of sacrifice. It's the pain of, of letting go of your hidden agendas, of your motivations, of all kinds of things and becoming gradually more and more pure in the love relationship. But in order to help this love to evolve, you have to go to the next stage. And the next stage is the stage of knowledge. Now, what is it that you begin to know? You have to know yourself and you have to know the other. <coughs> And, and when you focus on that, the process of self-knowledge becomes the primary uh, goal uh, because the ultimate level of self-knowledge 
and knowledge of the other, these two together, is the next valley. This is what? Valley of unity. You cannot create unity with the object of your love unless you develop a certain degree of self-knowledge and knowledge of the other person. You have to get to know the other person. You see, at the beginning of love relationship, you love the other person blindly. You really don't know that person. You are hoping that that person has certain qualities that you think he or she has. Okay. But then, the, as you establish this relationship, love relationship, then you have to begin to go through the path of self-discovery, first of all, because whenever you fall in love, you realize that the, the love, the beloved puts a lot of demand on you. Okay, love doesn't come free. They put a lot of demands on you. You have to change your habits. You have to share your bed. You have to, you know, you have to do all kind of things that before you were free and you didn't need to do it. But suddenly this person has come to your life and has is putting all of these demands on you. And you have to therefore be willing to let go of a lot of the comfort and all of those things that you had in the level at the level of being single. Okay? Now you're connected. And this level then becomes very conflicted, the process of self-knowledge. Because you have to get to know yourself better and you have to get to know the other person better. And, and you have to fall in love again. And you have to fall in love again with the qualities of that person that you discover in the relationship. Okay? And, and that's the reason that many marriages that break up is because people before they get married, they, they really try very hard to make themselves lovable. <laughs> but as soon as they get married, let's forget about it. <laughs> The, the, yeah, you say, well, you, you have to love me the way I am. Why should I love you the way you are? <laughs> you know, you, you made yourself lovable. You have to continue to make yourself lovable. <laughs> and I have to make a, you cannot love somebody that doesn't try to make himself or herself lovable. Okay. So this whole process of, of giving up, you know, you say, okay, I have done it now, you know. I tricked the person, they got married, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, that, and that's the motive uh, process, the motive dimension. We have to move on, and we have to get to know ourselves, we have to know, get the other, and we have to fall in love constantly with the new positive qualities of the other person that we discover, and the sacrifices that we do for each other, and the pain that we go to get it. And as we do, and as the level of our knowledge of each other increases, and knowledge of ourselves increases self-knowledge, then we enter the next level, which is level of unity. You see, the fruit of the tree of love is unity. Okay? The fruit of the tree of love is unity. In other words, a love Relationship is not a relationship free from difficulty. All relationships are difficult. Okay? Even relationship with ourselves is difficult. Okay? Let alone relationship with other people. How much difficult you have with yourself, you know? What, looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, oh my God, you know, okay? <laughs> You know, it's difficult, okay? So, relationships are difficult, okay? So, the sign of a strong relationship, a strong love, strong love is unity. Meaning, in spite of the difficulties, the pain, 
the sacrifice, the demands, we are united. We stay together. We continue that process. And that relationship then would takes us to other stages of maturation and development and both not both on the next three stages of the seven valleys. Now in the writings of Baha'i Faith we, we discover that in order for people to be able to establish meaningful, lasting, unifying relationships, they have to have a mutual object of love. And the higher that mutual object of love is, the greater that mutual love is, the purer that object is, the higher, the purer, the greater the extent of your love is. And the highest of all, of course, is God. Because God is the source of all good, the source of all beauty, the source of all mercy, the source of all knowledge, the source of all that is good. And therefore, if we establish a loving relationship with God and make our lives God-centered rather than self-centered, rather than people-centered, rather than money-centered, rather than whatever-centered. When you make your life God-centered, then that impacts all other relationships that you have. Now, humanity is now totally the opposite of being God-centered. The whole notion of being God-centered has disappeared from, from the agenda of humanity. Religion is, is not looked upon very positively. The notion of God is a difficult notion for many people. And the idea of being God-centered is very misunderstood because people think God-centeredness means that you have to be like a, a, a priest or an ayatollah or mullah or, uh, or uh, somebody like that, which is, of course, awful. You know, who wants to be a priest or this or that? Or that? That's not the idea. The God-centeredness has to have expression in everyday life, in what we do, in realities of life. You cannot, you cannot go to a monastery or, or to a cave or someplace like that and say, I'm living a God-centered life. That's not a God-centered life. That's self-centered life. The God-centered life has to take place in the, in the domain of life of humanity. Okay, those who isolate themselves in order to become God-centered, they, they, they are not involved in, in this spiritual battle. Okay, where, so it's a very interesting, let me continue what Abdul Baha said to that Krishna person, which is very interesting, uh, 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 you know, because he continued to talk about the whole notion. You remember he said, uh, in order that love may manifest its power, there must be an object, an instrument, and a motive. Okay? Then he says, there are many ways of expressing the love principles. There is a love for the family, for the country, for the race. There is political enthusiasm. There is also the love of community of interest in service. These are all ways and means of showing the power of love. We must find a way of spreading love among sons of humanity. Love is unlimited, boundless, infinite. 
Material things are limited, circumscribed, finite. You cannot adequately express infinite love by limited means. The perfect love, here we are, all of us perfect lovers, the perfect love needs an unselfish instrument absolutely freed from the feathers of every kind. The love of family is limited. The tie of blood relationship is not the strongest bond. Frequently members of the same family disagree and even hate each other. Patriotic love is finite. The love of one's country is causing hatred of all others is not perfect love. Compatriots, compatriots also are not free from quarrels amongst themselves. Think of Syria right now. Okay. The love of race is limited. There is some union here, but there is insufficient love. Love must be from free from boundaries. To love our own race may mean hatred of all others, and even people of the same race often dislike each other. Political love also is much bound up with hatred of one party for another. This love is very limited and uncertain. The love of community, of interest in service, is likewise fluctuating frequently, Competitions arise, which lead to jealousy, and at length hatred replaces love. All these types of love are imperfect. It is clear that limited material ties are insufficient to adequately express the universal love. The great unselfish love for humanity is bounded by none of these imperfect, semi-selfish bonds. This is the one perfect love possible to all mankind and can only be achieved by the power of Divine Spirit. No worldly power can accomplish the universal love. Abdul Baha concluded his talk with the council love one another. Okay. That was in Paris, 1912. The world is still is the same way, even worse. Right? The whole notion is that if we want to develop a universal love, we have to have a transcendent universal object of love and through that transcendent universal object of love we will automatically get closer to others we will become universal we become all encompassing we will become all accepting our love then takes a totally different expression now there is much more to talk about love, and uh, I think we are we have been sitting here for a long time. You know, earlier today I went uh, started reading this book. You know, Unity, the Creative Foundation of Peace. Okay, you now Unity of Faith and Reason in Action, and uh, I was surprised of what was in the book, it reminded me of a, a statement. The statement says that behind or beside every successful man is a surprised woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you have heard that. Okay. <laughs> behind every successful man is a surprised woman. And that I realized that behind Every relatively good book is a surprise author. (laughs) 
because I opened it and started reading it and I was surprised of the things that I saw in the book about love. And I said, oh, that's, that's a good one. But I was surprised. But anyway, speaking of divine love and the love that we have, you know, let me conclude with a personal reminiscence. As you know, the Baha'i community in Iran since uh, early 1980s, early, since 1980, and just a year before that, 1979, has been in a tremendous crisis since the revolution began. And the Baha'is uh, became the object of persecution of a uh, profoundest level. And many, many of my friends and colleagues and elders that I knew when I was living in Iran have been killed. And many of them now are in jail and in prison. Now, one of the people that I knew was uh, I was living at that time in Shiraz during my first year of medical school. And uh, the chairman of the spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Shiraz was a really a remarkable person by the name of Yadullah Wahdat. And he... He was uh, actually an army man, but he was retired at that time. And he was uh, extremely kind and loving and funny and marvelous person. And somebody that you really like to know. And uh, you learn a lot from them and so forth. So he was taken to prison. And... uh, He was killed after a short period of imprisonment. And before he died, he wrote a a number of letters. And in one of the letters, he wrote a poem for his family. And in the poem, he says... The fire of love is alive. You're talking about the divine love, you know, the love that is connected to the divine, God-centered love. He says, the fire of love is alive, even when death arrives. It is a lamp carried from this house to the other. The fire of love is alive, even when death arrives. It is a lamp carried from this house to the other, which which is very interesting. The whole notion of when you go place to place and person to person, In love, you are carrying light with you. You bring light to wherever you go. And not only you bring light to the other place, you also find your way. Because it's a lamp. It's a light. Love opens the doors to you. If you are a loving person, doesn't matter where you go, doesn't matter who you see, doesn't matter whether you know the language or you don't know language, doesn't matter anything. Somehow that love opens the doors to you. And I'm sure you have many of you have had experience of that time. 
and it's the most exciting thing because out of a blue the door opens and you see things that you otherwise wouldn't alright I think is enough if you want to read there is much more in this book and also in the psychology of spirituality in those two books I have written a lot about the concept of love and uh, we can find it thank you